Hello everyone and welcome to part one of this ARIMA code along lecture where we're actually going to be using Python and stats models to implement ARIMA and seasonal ARIMA on a real data set. And I think at the end of this entire series of lectures you'll get a good understanding of why ARIMA probably may not always be a good choice for financial data and stock information. Let's hop over to a Jupyter Notebook and get started. Okay, here I am at a new Jupyter Notebook and the general process for ARIMA models is the following. First, we want to visualize the time series data, actually get to understand it. Then we want to make the time series data stationary if necessary. Then we'll want to plot the correlation and autocorrelation charts. Remember that's the ACF and then also partial autocorrelation charts. That will help us understand what parameters, what values we should use when we construct our ARIMA model. Then we actually use that model to make predictions on future data points. That is called forecasting. So we're gonna go through all these steps and the very first step is to actually get the data. So we're going to be using some data about monthly milk production. It's a seasonal data set and it's already saved as a CSV file for you under the time series analysis folder. But let's go ahead and do a couple of imports here and get it loaded up. I'm going to just do the usual ones. We'll import NumPy as NP, import pandas as PD, we'll import statsmodels.api as SM. And then we'll also do some visualizations. So we'll say import matplotlib dot pyplot as plt. And if you get this warning, don't worry, it's just a warning. Later on, they'll update stats models to be up to date to the latest pandas version. It's just a warning, it's not actually an error. And finally, we'll say matplotlib inline. Okay, so let's go ahead and read in that data set. We'll say df is equal to pd. Let me zoom in one more level here. We'll say df is equal to pd read underscore csv. And our file that we're going to be working with is called the monthly milk production. So let's go ahead and grab that. We'll say monthly, and we should be able to hit tab, get autocomplete. I can hit tab because I'm in the same directory. If you're not in the same directory, just pass in the whole file path to the csv file. And then we're going to check out the head of this. Okay. So we have this month column and then this kind of awkwardly named monthly milk production pounds per cow, January 62 to December 75. And there's a little question mark there because it wasn't able to interpret that uh, letter. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is kind of work with this data and make sure it's in the correct format for our ARIMA model. A couple things, we probably wanna change this. This is a really long name. Uh, it's unnecessary to say in the column name what the dates are. We also want to change this month to be a date time index and get rid of this normal index. So let's go ahead and clean it up. We'll start off by just renaming the columns. I'm going to say these columns, let's go ahead and keep month. That works for now. And then we'll say for this other column, we'll say milk in pounds per cow. And so DF head. Okay, so we get milk in pounds per cow. We got rid of this kind of awkwardly January 6 to December 75 portion. And then what we're also gonna do is if we check out the tail of this data frame, you'll notice there's kind of this weird value here for that month. It's like a string and then it's missing some data. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna drop that. So we're gonna say df dot drop 168 axes is equal to zero and we'll say in place equals true. And then if I check out my tail now, I've gotten rid of that index position 168. Okay, up next, we're going to convert the monthly column to a date time column. And that's easy, we know how to do that. We just say df month and set it equal to pd to date time and then we'll say df month. Now if I check out the head of my data set, it should look the same, except now I have a little day here indicating that it's month. So let's continue on. And so this next step that we're gonna do is actually set the index. So we'll say set the index to be the month column, and we'll have this be in place equals true. So then if I check out the head of my data frame, I've converted this month index, milk and pounds per cow. It's a time series, I can confirm that by saying DF index and I see it's a date time index and perfect. And as a nice little final step, what we can do here now that we've cleaned up the data is I can call describe on this and then I, I personally like to transpose the describe data frame. So I get it out kind of like this nice one row. I can see the count, the mean, standard deviation, uh, the max, etc. just statistical information. 
and I have 168 rows. Looks like on average it's 754 pounds of milk per cow. So now we're on to step two. Remember step two is to visualize the data. So this is actually quite easy for us, essentially just uh, index and one column. So we can say DF plot. I can see here the milk in pounds per cow. And you should immediately uh, start thinking this is seasonal data. Clearly there's some sort of seasonal behavior. So we have a seasonality portion to it. And it seems to also have a trend that seems to be trending upwards a little bit. So what you should also be thinking is, hey, I can confirm that it has a trend aspect and that it has a seasonality aspect by actually doing some sort of ETS on this, some sort of error trend seasonality decomposition. So we're going to explore that later on in just a little bit. But what I also want to show is calculating, for instance, the 12 month rolling average or simple average. So let's go ahead and say my time series is equal to DF milk in pounds per cow. Just tab autocomplete there. So now if I check the type of time series, it's a series instead of just a data frame. And I just reassigned it to time series so I don't have to keep typing out this uh, giant column name. So then what I'm going to do is just grab my time series and I'm going to call rolling on it. And let's go ahead and calculate the essentially what is a 12 month rolling simple average. And the simple moving average is a reflection of the yearly moving average because remember each row at each index position is a month worth of data, which means 12 of those months, that's a year. So then I'm going to plot this and let's just give this a label. We'll say 12 month rolling mean. And then I'm also going to plot the time series itself. All right, so if we see this, we can see here that this 12 month rolling mean is definitely showing some sort of upwards trend in milk. It's also pretty obvious just to our eyes that there's some sort of upward trend here. And we can kind of almost just visually here separate the trend versus the seasonality. And what's also common to do in these sort of plots is to plot out the standard deviation. So we want to kind of check is the variance changing at all. So we'll say STD here and we'll say instead of rolling mean, we'll say STD. So it's kind of checking, hey, on a yearly basis, is the standard deviation changing a lot? Is uh, one year kind of crazy for milk production? And let's go ahead and say PLT legend so we can see the actual names of the columns in that plot. And this is a really common plot you'll see with time series data where you see the actual data, the kind of rolling mean or simple moving average trend line. And then usually at the bottom, uh, you'll see some rolling standard deviation. Usually the scale of standard deviation is much lower than the actual values. And that pretty much makes sense for most time series data sets. What you don't want to see is kind of some crazy behavior here on this 12 month rolling standard deviation. If in comparison, it looks uh, pretty flat to in comparison to your normal data set, then you know, you're know you dealing with something that's uh, pretty workable. All right, now the next thing we can check out visually is our ETS decomposition plot. That is the error, trend, and seasonality decomposition. Remember that decomposition plot, what it does is it mathematically separates out the trend component, the seasonality component, and then the residual, that's the error that's not explained by seasonality or trend. And it plots them up uh, nicely for us. And we can do that with stats model pretty easily. So we end up saying, we'll say from statsmodels.tsa.seasonal import seasonal decompose. And then what we'll go ahead and do is we'll say uh, decomposition, or we'll just say decomp here is equal to seasonal decompose. And then we'll pass in that time series that we've been messing around with. Remember, that's just the milk and pounds column from our data frame. And then all we have to say is decomp.plot, and we'll get back our decomposition data. So our ETS decomposition, we can see the observed values, the trend, the seasonal values, and then the residual. You'll notice here that because of the way stats models currently interacts with Jupyter Notebook, you end up getting two plots, and that has to do with the way it's returning the plot. So if you actually want to make sure that you just get a single plot, what you can end up doing is something like this. You can set fig equal to decomp.plot, and then you'll get back one plot. And what's also nice about this is if you want to edit the size of this plot, you can say fig dot and call set underscore size. You'll notice there's a bunch of matplotlib calls here that you can do. And then you can set size inches, so you can do something like, uh, well, I don't know, 
let's say 15 by 8, and this will kind of clear it up for us. Notice I'm really zoomed in, so it may not look uh, this way for you. It won't be this large. It'll probably be a little smaller, but here we can clearly see our observed data. There's clearly an upwards trend. The seasonality component seems to be uh, kind of on a yearly frequency here, and then the residual data. There's another argument you can specify for the seasonal decompose, and if we take a look at it here, uh, we chose an additive model to default because it looks like it's just kind of some linear growth. It doesn't look like it's a uh, multiplicative. And then there's uh, filt and frequency. So this frequency argument that we've kind of touched on before a little bit is the frequency of the series. So it has to be used if X is not a pandas object. And if it is a pandas object, what it's going to do is uh, override the default, uh, what's known as periodicity. So basically what you'd end up doing here is if you wanted to make sure that every period was a yearly period for the season, you could say, hey, set my frequency to be 12. And then you would see something like this. Now, basically, this is the exact same result, but what you're kind of specifying here is, okay, every 12 months is going to be a year, and that's what I kind of want you to focus on as far as the seasonal data. And usually you can do this automatically if it's a pandas date time index. So typically you don't need to provide it, but I just want you to be aware of it just in case you ever find yourself needing it in the future. Okay. The next thing you want to do is test for stationarity. We'll go ahead and do that in the very next lecture video. Now we finished the visualization tasks, so we're going to move on to some of the more mathematical tasks that will allow us to set up for the ARIMA model coming up next. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.